Happy Lord's Day, everyone. Please turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy 2. Today we'll continue in our series in 2 Timothy that we've entitled Guard the Gospel. This is the Lord's Day, and we are the Lord's people. Let me also say welcome to all our guests. We're so happy that you're here today. Thank you for coming. For those that are streaming online, we love you. Hope you're well. And I'll give you just another moment to turn to 2 Timothy 2. And while you're turning there, I'll begin... Do you remember the story of David when he sinned with Bathsheba? We're not going to go into all the details, but David committed adultery with Bathsheba and sinned greatly through that event. Afterward, he repented, and that repentance was captured when he wrote Psalm chapter 51. Here are a couple verses from that chapter up on the screen. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity... And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. When David says, purge me with hyssop, he's referring to the way Israel trusted God to atone for sin. The the ritual, the religious ritual that they would perform. Hyssop, it's a small brushy plant. It's in the mint family. And the priest would take a bunch of the hyssop in his hand. He would dip it in the blood uh, that had been gathered from an animal who had been sacrificed for sin. And they would They would take that hyssop that had been dipped in blood and they would swing it at the people and the blood would sprinkle on the people. That's quite a ritual. The picture signified that their sins were paid for by the blood. And all of this points to and is fulfilled in Jesus. Points to Jesus and is fulfilled in Jesus. Listen closely. We're all sinners. We all need to have our sins paid for. We cannot pay for our sins, ourself. Our offense against God is too great. The punishment for sin is death. Physical death, yes. But more than that, eternal death. Or what's been called hell, what's known as hell. Sin that is not paid for condemns people to eternal death. That's how costly sin is. And we know from obvious observation that the blood of animals, no matter how large that animal is, even if it's a bull, cannot truly pay for the sins of human beings. If a human sins against God, a human has to pay the penalty for that sin. The animals are just a temporary placeholder at that time. And so David is referencing in his own context, but he's really looking forward to Jesus. Jesus, the God-man, who would live without sin, and when he dies, he does not die to pay for his own sin, But his blood is applied to everyone who trusts him. He dies for the forgiveness of others' sins, of their sins, of our sins. His death is a substitute for ours. His blood pays our debt to God. And you can see that every one of us needs God to cleanse us. We need God to sprinkle us with the blood of Jesus, to cleanse us with the blood of Jesus. We cannot do it ourselves. It's outside of us. David says, God, you wash me and I shall be. Only when you wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. When Jesus makes us clean, God then counts us as clean. And we call that justification. Justification. Just as if I'd never sinned. But once we are justified in the eyes of God through Jesus the Son, what then? 
Well, we continue to walk in that grace, but from there we follow Jesus and we grow throughout the course of our lives to become more like Jesus in our actual lives. We call this maturity or the process of progressive sanctification. And that is what our text is about today. Progressive sanctification. Let me make this proposal And then I'm going to read the text. And when I read the text, keep an eye out for my proposal in the text, okay? See if you see it there. Make sure I'm not being heretical. Here's the proposal. Cleanse yourself to serve with honor in the Lord's house. Cleanse yourself so that you can serve with honor in the master's house. So there is the cleansing that we must have from God, but once we have that cleansing, we must participate in cleansing ourselves as well. Let me read our text. So follow along 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, and following, keep an eye out for my proposition. Now in a great house, There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So did you see that in verse 21? If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. This is what we want. Don't you want that? To be cleansed so that you can be used for honorable use? We want to become useful servants, put to honorable tasks, to the glory of God in his house. There's no greater calling in life. When we do this, we fulfill the very purpose of our being, the reason God made us. And this text is going to tell us how to become cleansed so that we can be honorable servants, used for noble purposes. We have to cleanse ourselves. We've got to engage and participate in this. So first let's consider this calling to cleanse ourselves, to be cleansed. Remember Paul's condition. He's in a dark, crowded, dirty, damp, cold, and putrid cistern of a prison. He's essentially awaiting his execution, and he probably knows it, because he's not on house arrest this time. This time he's been thrown into a dungeon. He is writing for the last time, at least that we know of. He is using the last of his efforts, and maybe the last of his paper and ink, to encourage and to establish and to equip his younger co-laborer, Timothy, From these desperate conditions, Paul conjures up a picture, a glorious, warm, beautiful picture that must have brought him much comfort in those conditions, thinking about where he was headed upon his execution. He conjures up this picture to help Timothy understand the importance of continually growing to be more like Jesus. And notice here that Paul sees the maturation of Timothy and of others, because he wants Timothy to teach others and to entrust the word to others, he sees that as critical to the health, the longevity, and the stability of the church. That is exactly the same for us today. 
If we continually grow in the Lord as individuals, if every one of us engage in growing and work to cleanse ourselves, then the church will be strong and steady and able to face every trial. But if we fail to grow and we stagnate in our faith, if we shrug our shoulders and leave the maturity to others, then we should have no assurance that Crossway Church will be established into the future. Every member must pursue growth in Christ Jesus. And every member must cleanse themselves for the good of all. Timothy must, pastors must, every member must. The picture Paul comes up with is that of a great house. A great house is the house of a wealthy person or couple. This isn't the house that most of us live in. This is the kind of house that only the elite live in. Once Grace and I got to go on a sunset cruise in Naples, Florida. And before heading out to the Gulf, the boat pulled into a wealthy neighborhood because they know that we all like to see the lifestyles of the rich and famous, right? We all like to to glimpse that. And... um, There's a glory in it. And uh, I say we pulled in because the boat literally did that. It it, it pulled into their backyards essentially because the backyards of these houses were on great canals and each house had a massive dock and most of the houses had a massive yacht at each dock. And in this neighborhood, they're tearing down the older $2 million homes so that they can build Homes in the tens of millions of dollars. And this was happening over and over again. They're just making these houses bigger and bigger. And as we boated past, it was a lesson in the incredible wealth that some people have here on this earth. Wealth that most of us can't even possibly imagine. That's the kind of house that Paul's thinking about here. These kinds of houses don't just have one set of dishware and glassware. They have multiple sets, and the finest sets are used for the most notable events, for the greatest dignitaries that come to their homes and sit at their tables, while the everyday dishware is used for the servants and the children. This is what Paul's talking about. He talks about vessels of gold and silver, and he says they're used for noble purposes, events with honor, royalty, and precedence. Prime ministers. But then the cups and the pots and the plates of wood and the clay, they're for everyday use. Not the gold and silver. That's for noble use, but the other stuff. The wood and the clay utensils, they're used for everyday use. Some of them would have even been used as the trash cans of the house. When they had trash, food leftovers, bones and whatnot, they would throw it into these big clay pots. Eventually, they might even just break the pots down and let them decompose. That's the dishonorable use. Just the real common. In this picture, in this illustration. And in verse 21, we're told that the vessels for honorable use are useful to the master of the house. You get a sense from the master of the house, it's He's, he, he knows who he has coming over, and he wants to put out his best. He wants to honor. He wants this event to be special. And so he reaches for his best, his gold bowl, his silver plate, his crystal glasses. That's the useful servant, the noble servant. Now, this is an illustration here, but right, we know who the great master of the house is. It's the Lord. We're part of his household. And if we want, if we want to be useful to him, we have to cleanse ourselves. This picture, we should make two notes about this cleansing process that we're even getting a sense of here in the first couple of verses because the illustration gets stretched by Paul in imaginary directions. and It's based in reality, but then he goes a little bit beyond what we typically experience into sort of the miraculous. First, no cup, glass, dish, or pot cleanses itself. And 
Yet that's what we're told to do. We're told to cleanse ourselves. We're likened to these common plates and told to cleanse ourselves so that we can become uncommon or noble. If any of us had an invention for a self-cleaning glass, you'd have an instant market hit. You'd never have to work again because it would take a miracle for a glass to clean itself. You know, especially the those jars that you really you can't get anything into, and it's, you you love them because they look cool, but you gotta they're impossible to clean. So what do you do? You use them once and you throw them away or something. If it could clean itself, but it can't. But that's what we're called to. So there's a difference. And um, we're sinners saved by grace. So the point is that since God has cleansed us already through and through, we're now vessels with the miraculous ability to join in God's work and to clean ourselves too. That's amazing grace. It's a miracle. We couldn't do that before. But now we participate in our own cleansing. A second note to make on this illustration is this. When we clean a pot at home, alchemy doesn't happen. Our stainless steel pots and pans, they don't turn into gold or silver. But look at Paul's logic here. He's saying that if we will clean ourselves, we go from the uncommon or the ignoble to the uncommon and the noble. We go from clay and wood to gold and silver in this cleansing process. This cleansing process is more than a cleaning. It's a transformation. And when that happens in us, we're now suitable to serve in any number of honorable ways in the master's house. And we begin to reach and to touch and to fulfill the purpose for which we were made. And how glorious is that? We could say it like this. Our maturity is tied to our efforts to grow. And as we grow mature, we have more and more honorable service to do for the Lord. All this ties into an important theme. This scenario, in this, in this picture, it shows that we are the tools made to serve the Lord. We're just pots and pans and glasses and cups in the house. So if you say to yourself, where am I in this story that Paul's creating? We're not the honored guests. We're not the guests that the master's preparing for. He's got noble things to do, but we're the servants, and our greatest purpose is found in serving the master in his noble purposes. And this speaks to the greatness of God's plans the cosmic nature of them. Cosmos is probably not big enough a word to contain God's plans, but it's kind of the biggest thing we can imagine because it's unimaginable to us. We cannot imagine the bounds of the cosmos. But even the cosmos cannot contain God's plans. He is doing great things. I once heard a preacher say, if it isn't evident to us by now, it should be that we live in Whoville. We are, we are the, the tiniest creatures on the tiniest place in, in, in anything we can even imagine. What God's given us to understand, we're so, we're so minuscule. And yet, we have the opportunity to take place in his plan and to be leveraged for glorious, noble use by God. Dear brother and sister, that's who we are in Jesus Christ. Do you think your life is small? You're right. It is. It's tiny. It's minuscule. But God is great. And he wants to employ you in the greatness of his plan, in ways that we cannot even comprehend. All we have to do is step into maturity and partner with him in the cleansing of ourselves. And we're going to see how to do that here as we go. Now, before we move on, let me give you a great example of this. In our very midst, our brother Steve Heitland has served among us for over 15 years as a pastor elder. I can testify that as soon as he was able, even in some ways before he was able, 
he applied himself to study himself, to study to show himself approved by God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. And he spent years in the pursuit of understanding God's word better and better and better. He worked and he sacrificed, and his wife sacrificed, and his children sacrificed, and he exhausted himself. And I can vouch for that too, because sometimes I'd see him, he'd come, and, I, and I'd just think, man, he looks terrible. <laughs> he never looks all that good. I'm sorry, Lori. I don't, but sometimes he looked really bad. And now, just this past Thursday, he successfully defended his doctoral dissertation and in his oral defense, he passed with, with what is essentially an A++. He, he, uh, he passed his oral exam with distinction. That's as, as perfect as it gets. Yeah. In a couple of weeks, he's going to receive his PhD in biblical counseling, and we are the beneficiaries. Can you see that he's been cleansing himself by the pursuit of righteousness in God's word? And by doing that, he's, he's becoming someone that God can use for noble purposes. And that is a glorious, glorious thing. We actually have a scholar in our midst now. And so... Um, you know, he's going to demand a lot more respect from this church from now on. So please give him, in all seriousness, just celebrate with him and rejoice. Now, we're not all called to the exact same use, so uh, don't worry. You don't have to get your Ph.D. Uh, but what is your Ph.D. in the master's house? What should you be gaining skill in? How should you be cleansing yourself so that you can be useful to the work of God and his glorious plan? Cleanse yourself so that the Lord can put you to noble use. Cleanse yourself to serve with honor in the Lord's house. So let's now consider the cleansing. The first step we'll take a look at is fleeing and pursuing. Fleeing and pursuing. And that's just a, a quick note there up on the screen for main point number two. But let's put the next slide up. Let's put verse 22 up on the screen. So you have it right there in front of you for most of this point. Paul says, okay, you need to cleanse yourself. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We've been called as those belonging to God in Christ Jesus, to cleanse ourselves. Now we're being taught how to do it. That's why the word so is there. It's connected logically. The idea is in order to cleanse yourself, here is what you ought to do. And you probably noticed that there's a lot of running going on in this verse. There is fleeing and there is pursuing. Fleeing and pursuing. And we all know instinctively that there's a time to run away and then there's a time to run after, right? Paul's using those metaphors, fleeing and pursuing. These are strong words and strong phrases. Paul is, by the Holy Spirit, communicating these ideas with force. We don't simply back away from youthful passions. We flee. We run away as hard as we can. We sprint nor should we simply add righteousness and everything that follows in this verse. No, we pursue it wholeheartedly. We run till we grab a hold of it and make it ours. We flee from one and we pursue the other. Notice at this point that we're not given a lot to flee from. Just a phrase afterward. We're simply to flee from youthful passions. And when Paul uses the word passion, it generally means sin. Youthful passions, youthful desires, or the desires of the flesh, or passions of the flesh, it means sin. It's that impulse inside us that makes us susceptible to certain temptations and our inexperience and our immaturity 
and our inability to count the cost fully because we don't understand it. It's tied to that idea of youthfulness. And apparently some temptations and sins are more especially given to the young. And that makes sense to us, right? Because we understand as we grow older how when I've gained an experience and I come to the same thing the next time, I can utilize my experience to approach it better. The same is true with maturity in the Christian life. When I'm tempted to a certain sin and I fail, I know what that does to my relationship with Jesus and with others. I know the the wrestling with condemnation that comes from it. I know the vicious cycle that it wants to produce in me. I know these negative things. And so the next time I face that temptation, I carry that degree of maturity with me and I can utilize it to overcome. And so this idea of youthful passions or sins that are especially uh, tempted or tempting for the youth. And one category that comes quickly to mind is sexual sin. Sexual sin is not at all, as we know, limited to the young. But the young are faced especially with the strength of that temptation. And every one of us, as we grow and become of age, we have to face and and decide how are we going to engage sexuality, how are we going to engage the potential temptation of sexual sin. And then when we become a Christian, we have to determine, are, are we going to repent of it? Or we have to repent of sexual sin to become a believer, I should say it like that. So, there's sexual sin. I do think the context gives us more data on what Paul has in mind. Before these verses, you remember remember from last week, he's talking about irreverent babbling. We talked a lot about that last week and false teaching. In the next verses, he's going to talk about foolish and stupid controversies. We're going to get to that in a moment. Foolish and ignorant controversies or foolish and stupid controversies, whichever way you prefer to translate that. Could it be that the young are especially tempted to sins of the tongue? In context, is that what Paul is communicating to us? I think there's some evidence of that. The only problem is we're also tempted to sins of the tongue. But I do think the young, (coughs) in particular, are tempted that way. Paul doesn't give us a completely clear description of what he's thinking of when he speaks to youthful passions. And so that alone, the fact that he doesn't go into it, kind of tells us it's self-explanatory. It's probably along the lines of what he's thinking. It's probably a broader uh, category. And we probably, if we just think about it for a moment, can kind of understand what he means by youthful passions. But more importantly, he sets up what we are to run towards. And he does describe this a little bit. So he tells us what we to flee from, but then he tells us what to run towards towards. We run away from youthful passions because we're running toward four items that he listed out here, and they are righteousness and faith and love and peace. And if we are running toward these qualities, then we will at the same time be running away from youthful passions. Running in one direction accomplishes two purposes. It's running away from and running towards something else. Have you ever tried to run in two directions at once? You can't do it. It's impossible. And if you try, you'll trip and fall and make a fool of yourself. So when you're running, you're running away from something and running towards something else. And that's what we're being called to here. And by running towards these things that Paul lists, it's part of cleansing ourselves to be transformed into those vessels that will be used for noble purposes in the plan in the household of God. And so just consider these these four notes quickly. We're running toward these so that we can be cleansed and used for noble purposes. When we run toward righteousness, we do that by studying and learning who God is and what he has done in Christ Jesus. We learn that through his word. We learn it by hearing preaching and teaching from God's Word. We learn it by reading God's Word and applying God's Word. And we learn about who, the, who God is in Himself and what He's done for us in our Savior. We learn what is right and good. We learn what righteousness is. And that cleanses us. 
I mentioned last week that when we know the word of God, what we're doing is we're, we're learning about God and we're learning what righteousness looks like. What is the right and what is the wrong? We're learning what righteousness is. And as that becomes a part of who we are, as that gets inside of us, it affects everything. It affects all of our decisions. It affects our outlook. It affects, affects us so that we know what is wrong and what is right. The world doesn't get that. The world calls what's wrong. They call that, oh, that's right. And they call what's right. They say, oh, that's wrong. How do we know the difference? We learn righteousness through God's word. And it affects us deeply. And, and as we get good with God's word and grow mature in it, you know what it does? It e even affects our impulses and our instincts. So that in a moment, when we're faced with a tough decision, our impulses go in the righteous direction. Because we're being transformed into the image of Christ through righteousness. We're being cleansed. Well, when we run toward faith in prayer, we're crying out to God. And in being responsible with what God's put in front of us. Who's he made me to be? Who's in my life? Who's he given me responsibilities for? As I fulfill that, I do so because I'm trusting God and I'm demonstrating my trust in him. And I go to him in prayer. And as I run toward faith, we're affirming that God exists. Every time we have faith, it's like, yeah, of course God exists. He's there. I can call out to him. I was talking with our leadership training group the other day and someone brought up the, the illustration of the chair and how the chair is kind of an expression of faith. You look at the chair and you, you, just, you know that that chair is going to hold you, which is why you sit in it. You have faith. Before you do it, you have faith that the chair will hold you. And one of the things I love about that illustration is we do this all the time with chairs. Probably not one of us thought this morning when we looked at the chair we're about to sit and we probably didn't think, hmm, I don't know if that's going to hold me up. And we just sat in it. That's what we're doing when praying. It's like sitting in a chair. It's like saying, God, you're there. Of course you're there. Of course you're there. Of course you're good. Of course you reward those who diligently seek you. Of course if I cry out to you, you'll give me grace in Jesus Christ. Of course, of course, of course. We gather together in his name. That's faith in the Lord. We fulfill the responsibilities he's given us. That's faith in him. And in doing so, we cleanse ourselves. And become more mature. When we run toward love, we do that by sacrificing ourselves for the good of others. We're looking out for one another. We're putting others ahead of ourselves. And when we do that, we are demonstrating Jesus Christ and his work on the cross for, for us. When we love each other sacrificially, putting one another ahead of ourselves, we're demonstrating Jesus Christ and cleansing ourselves. And when we run toward peace, by taking our own souls to task and taking the log out of our own eyes before we remove the speck and thinking the best of our brothers and sisters and minding our tongues and testifying about Jesus so that people out there can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. This is the ministry of reconciliation. It's peace. And when we do that, we're cleansing ourselves, growing mature, so that God can use us for his noble purposes again and again and again and again. When we run in this direction and we run against youthful passion, passions or away from youthful passions, we do so with a group of other marathoners. We do so together. We're not running alone. Rather, we run with all of those who call on the name of the Lord with a pure heart. And that is very encouraging, isn't it? Let me ask then, what are you really motivated in right now? Think about what's going on in your life. What are you even tempted to think about this morning while I'm preaching? It's like, okay, good checkout point. Check out. Think about that thing I really want to think about. Oh, oh that's right. We're, we've got a sermon. I understand. Believe me, I understand. What are, you, what are you motivated by now? What's animating you? What can't you look for? What, what can't, uh, uh, what, how do I say that? <laughs> What, what do you look forward to so much you just can't wait to get to? What's motivating you? And I, only raised, I, I raised this idea to just get us to think for a moment. Maybe that thing is a very good thing. And maybe it's right that you should be motivated by it. But what about, what about cleansing ourselves? 
What about running away from youthful passions and running to righteousness and, and love and peace? What about that? These should not be low on our list. These should be high on our list. God wants to stir us up so that this is what we're engaged in and so that we grow and mature to his glory. Would you examine yourself by asking yourself if you're in the race, if you're running? And let me encourage you, the Lord has a purpose for you, a noble use. He's waiting for you to do some cleaning, some cleansing, and to start pursuing so that he can give you some noble tasks that he wants you to fulfill. Don't settle with the, with the ignoble. Don't settle with the common. You're in the master's house. He's cleansing you for his noble uses. Cleanse yourself to serve with honor in the Lord's house. And then we're given further instruction on how to cleanse ourselves. It's by dealing with quarrels and correction. Quarrels and correction. So look at your Bibles again. Look at verses uh, 23, chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 to 26. I'll read it for you again. I want to keep it right in front of us. Verses 23 to 26. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. One of the challenges we've seen in in all of chapter 2, really, is that we're called to discern between different kinds of speech. And this is rather critical. Not all speech is the same. Not all speech should be engaged at the same level. Not all speech should be taken in to the same degree. Some speech should be taken in all the way to the heart. Some speech should be held with, a, as, as we say, a grain of salt. Some speech should be tucked away and, and, and hidden back in the heart and mind. Like, okay, let me, see if that ha- let me see if that's true and examine. Some speech should be rejected. And some speech should be challenged. Some speech should even be rebuked. And it's up to us, certainly for the pastor, but all of us engage in this exercise of discerning between different categories and kinds of speech. It's really rather critical to the health of our soul and to our own maturation, to cleansing ourselves and to the health and the, and the strength of the church. And so last people, Timothy was told to charge God's people. That's right and good. Paul's saying you need to charge them to remember certain things. At the same time, Paul uh, tells Timothy to avoid irreverent babble. And so you can see sometimes Timothy is to speak and to speak with compulsion, to speak with strength. Other times, he's just supposed to avoid certain kinds of speech. The difference is the kind of speech. And that's the discernment that's critical And that helps us know how we should respond. We need to grow in those categories. So you avoid the bad speech, the irreverent babble. But we might ask, well, who's going to make that call? And I'm saying we need to learn how to do that. But here again in the verses we're reading, it's really, and this is the same context, right? So you can expect a similar thing. We have a call here uh, from Paul by the Holy Spirit uh, for Timothy the elder to teach the church and correct opponents. Paul's saying, you need to speak. You have to teach and you have to correct some people. And at the same time, Timothy is to completely avoid foolish and ignorant, or maybe stupid, controversies. So again, some speech is good and necessary, and some speech is worthless and can be harmful. Who makes that call? Some of us live like we never need to make that call. Some of us live like that there's no, there's no distinction between categories of speech, but, but there clearly is. And we have to grow. That's part of our cleansing. 
so that we can grow mature and be useful. Well, in this case, Paul knows the difference. And he's teaching Timothy to grow and to know the difference in the categories of speech. And this is actually part of Timothy cleansing himself so that he can become more useful to the Lord. Where, where, how is he cleansing himself? Well, he's cleansing himself by teaching. He's cleansing himself by correcting certain opponents. And he's cleansing himself by avoiding certain speech. And we can argue that since this is God's word, that all of us should also grow to know uh, when to correct versus when to avoid quarreling. Certainly the pastor elders have to learn this distinction. And it is one of the most relevant things we have to learn, one of the most applicable. But so should every maturing Christian who desires to, to do noble service in the house of the master. And this is a part of running toward righteousness and a part of cleansing ourselves, a part of running away from youthful passions. Notice the spirit-inspired logic of Paul's argument. Pastors should avoid... Foolish, ignorant controversies. Why? What's the reason given? What's the logic? Well, the logic to avoid these is because they breed quarrels. Okay, so right off the bat, in general, quarreling is not something we want. Sometimes you must quarrel, but in general, quarreling is not what we want. And certainly, long, protracted argument or argue, um, arguing or quarreling is not what we want. But there's more to the logic. It goes on. Why else? Well, because the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. So we want to avoid these ignorant, foolish controversies because they breed quarreling. And we want to avoid quarreling because the Lord's servant, the pastor elder, should not be quarrelsome. And we're going to get that filled out for us. The Lord's servant, the pastor elder, and it makes sense because if quarreling is generally not good, tends to tear down and tear apart, then we don't want leaders to be doing more quarreling than is utterly necessary. But look at what comes next. As I said, the Lord's servant must be kind to everyone able to teach, patiently enduring evil, and correcting his opponents with gentleness. And so just think that through. Kind to everyone. Not even Jesus, at least the world would say, not even Jesus was kind to everyone. Now, if you consider a, a rebuke kindness at points, then I think he was kind to everyone. So yeah, he was kind to everyone. But at least in the way that the world thinks of kindness, which is generally niceness, they wouldn't have thought that Jesus was kind all the time. But generally speaking, Jesus was kind. Able to teach. The Lord's servant must be able to teach. He understands God's word and he can communicate God's word. And who was the very best at that? Well, Jesus was the very best at that. And the Lord's servant must patiently endure evil. And who does that make us think of? It makes us think of Jesus on the cross, patiently enduring evil. And then he's supposed to correct his opponents with gentleness, the, uh, this Lord's servant. Correct his opponents with gentleness. Again, Jesus would not have always been considered gentle by the world, but generally speaking, he was kind and he was gentle. So think of Jesus after his resurrection, talking to Peter. Peter had abandoned him in one of the greatest examples of hypocrisy recorded in history. And poor Peter has that recorded. I'm sure Peter glories in the grace given to him now. Now think about that. He, he abandoned the Lord at the Lord's time of need, after Peter swore that he would never do so. And Jesus talks to him later. He says, Peter, do you love me? 
ask him three times. It was hard for Peter that the Lord would ask him three times. But don't forget what the Lord said to him. The Lord said, feed my sheep. You see, the Lord was cleansing Peter, and Peter was beginning to cleanse himself, and the Lord was giving him a noble purpose in his house, in his plan. That is the kindness and the love. That is our Savior, and that is what we have in him as well. The Lord's servant is demonstrating Jesus to the church. Pastor elders are supposed to demonstrate Jesus to some degree, to a large degree, to the church. And that is why the Lord's servant should not engage with foolish and ignorant controversies. And so what are foolish and ignorant controversies as we grow to understand these categories of speech? Again, we're not given a detailed description here. But we should be able to tell as we study all of Scripture, as we learn who God is and what He's done, we should be able to tell the difference. We won't be able to tell at the very first, but as we grow and as we engage, this should become a category for us. So let me give you an example. I'm going to reach for a big example, an easy example, an example we can all examine. And that is how we handled COVID-19 as a church. And of course, we've talked about this many times. We've talked about, we talk about it less these days, but it's still very important because we all experienced it. At first, when COVID-19 was first announced, and it was, you know, I forget if it was 10 days or two weeks to crush the curve or whatever it was, whatever that was. We immediately supported the government's approach. Romans 13, we are thankful for the authorities that God has given in the civil government, and we're going to be responsive to them, uh, all the way to the point of them being disobedient to God. And so we immediately supported the government's approach. But fairly quickly, fairly quickly, we began to see that things were not adding up. And society's approach to these things was an affront to what the Bible teaches us about the human race being made in the image of God and about the church, what it is to be and to do. And so very quickly we began to see that that there is a conflict with the idea of constantly covering the human face which is given by God and is good and to do that continually in public. That's problematic for the Bible-believing Christian. And we began to see that constantly standing at a distance, the idea of social distancing, was a problem for the Bible-believing Christian. That's not how humans are made. And we began to see that constantly keeping the healthy in quarantine, saying to the healthy, you stay in quarantine. You don't go out. By the way, we had it a lot better here than than many other countries had it. In other countries, it was a complete lockdown. In Bolivia, you you were, by your your alphabetical, uh, by your last name alphabetically, you were given two days a week that you could go out, basically to go grocery shopping. Couldn't even leave your home. Keeping the healthy in quarantine is not a biblical concept. It is the opposite of the principles the Scripture teaches. Constantly keeping grieving and hurting family apart is not the way humans are made. And then the state even going so far, in some places worse than others, as to recommend, and then even in some places try to require the church to 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 refrain from meeting is the insertion of civil government into the sphere of authority that belongs to the church as the upending of God's order. And as we pastors gain clarity, we came to the point that we're not going to argue this thing. We began to teach, this is what we're going to be do, what we're going to do. For those that may struggle, we met with them, those that wanted to meet, and we spoke with them and we instructed them in what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
But we're not quarreling about this. We're not arguing. The, the, the argument's over. The church is going to be the church. The Bible is the standard. And that's that. And if people are saying you have to wear masks to love one another, that is a misuse of Scripture. And we're not bowing to that. During that time, we had many good conversations. We had a few tough conversations. But we weren't quarrelsome, even when some people accused us of not being loving. Because we weren't requiring masking. We sought to correct, and then we were done, that's it, no quarreling. This is cleansing to the church strengthening to the church and is the right way to parse out these categories of speech and how to handle them. That's just one example, but it's a good one, I think, because there are many more. This is extremely applicable to life, and it's up to us to grow and to understand those categories. And uh, we're all to engage it and grow and to cleanse ourselves. Now, sometimes we think we must quarrel forever to save someone. But look again at verses 25 and 26. If you go to verse 25, about halfway through, where uh, it's talking, you know, Paul's teaching Timothy about correcting his opponents with gentleness. And he tells, he tells Timothy why. He says, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and, that, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You know, people that want to quarrel over foolish and ignorant controversies are caught in the snare of the devil. We understand that. That's the category. It's pretty serious. Now, it doesn't mean that they fully belong to him per se, but they are stuck in sin and they are in trouble. And they're clearly not, they're at a point where they're quarreling, so they're not open to reason. And so it might not be the things that we say, but it might be the way that we say it that is their way out. That's why the way that we engage, the gentleness, um, and even ending the quarrels, I'm not going to argue about this, it's where I stand. That is sometimes the way for them to get out. You're not going to get them out by quarreling, by arguing, but you might get them out by not quarreling. That's quite a thought. Cleanse yourself to serve with honor in the Lord's house. I want to ask Doug to come in a moment. We're going to come to the Lord's table. So why don't you stretch your legs, please stand with me, and we'll prepare our hearts. Coming to the Lord's table is the best way to respond to the Word of God. If you're a baptized believer in good standing with your church, please join us at the Lord's table. If you're not, what are you waiting for? You need your sins to be forgiven. They're hanging around your neck like a noose. They're going to trigger judgment by God. Go to God and repent from your sin. You'll have forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Come and be baptized in his name and then you'll join us at the Lord's table forever. The Lord faithfully sent his son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will gain eternal life. That is certain. As they were eating, he took bread. After blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Let's pray together and then the ushers will release the rose and you can come and partake.